Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm not sure if I should have watched this movie with Eyes Wide Shut. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Eyes Wide Shut, which released in 1999, based on the novella by Arthur Schnitzler and written by Stanley Kubrick and Frederick Raphael and directed by Stanley Kubrick. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Dr. Bill Harford, played by Tom Cruise. He's a successful doctor married to a beautiful wife, Alice, played by Nicole Kidman. When Alice reveals to Dr. Bill that she may have had a secret fantasy about cheating on him, this sends his life into a bit of a spiral and he spends the next two days looking out into the world and finding himself in some really weird sexual situations. Will he be able to find his way back home to his wife or will he be lost forever? So this was the final film of the master of his craft, Stanley Kubrick, his swan song, if mm -hmm. you will. And uh, this film it didn't do incredibly well no. from the critics when it came out. Yeah. However, it was Stanley Kubrick's highest grossing film of all time. Oh, wow. Really? Uh, which is pretty damn amazing. Yeah. Uh, but this film was also not only criticized for the story, but also for its content. Mm. Now, the film was advertised as an erotic thriller. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily what Kubrick set out to make, but it was <laughs> advertised that way, and for whatever reason, it put a lot of bums in seats. <laughs> uh, mainly because, you know, Tom Cruise and Nicole, Nicole Kidman were yeah. huge stars at the time. Yes. They were also married at the time, yeah. and so also, from the sounds of things, were going to attend a great big orgy of flesh yeah. in this movie. Mm. And of course, because... The entire production of the film was kept in, well, secrecy. No one really knew what the film was about, what was going on, and that the film took, well, three to four years to make. Yeah. <laughs> now, we all know that Stanley Kubrick is a perfectionist, and there are many uh, accounts of Tom Cruise having to do more than 80 takes of just walking through a door just to satisfy the director and getting, making sure he got the exact shot that he wanted. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But that also went on behind the scenes as well with the secrecy where he had Nicole Kidd directed or gave her a note separately as well as Tom Cruise. Yeah. Now there's an entire history behind this film where Kubrick wanted to make this film like 20 years before it actually went into development. Mm. He brought the rights to the book years in advance then made some other films before he finally built up to this one. And I remember when this film came out and I was like well considering how it was advertised I thought it was pretty tame. Yeah it is. And yeah. I didn't really get much of the content in the film now no. i put that down to my lack of life experience at the time yeah yeah and subsequently forgot about this film and kind of relegated it to probably the lowest tier of kubrick movies and well i think a lot of people are you know it's been more than 20 years since the film came out mm. are sort of reappraising it and looking back on it now because of the stigma attached to it has kind of waned really well that's what i've always said for a number of years now isn't it you know you can watch a film at one point in your life and not get it and then watch it again at another point in your life and be like oh my god how did i miss this the first time around you need to keep going back you need to keep trying it from different angles the way you dif feel may change um this was my first time i was an eyes wide shut virgin did you wiki it after i watched it oh! after <laughs> after i watched it i was like all right um gary and i we looked at our list and we were going for it and i was just like man I've never seen Eyes Wide Shut. I'd, I'd heard all the stuff. I, I, you know, I'd heard what the critics had said when the movie had first came out. I'm a bit of a Kubrick fan. I do like his work, but this one movie, I was like, nah, I'm good. I, I I'm good. I, I have no, in, no interest in watching uh, a, a kind of erotic thriller involving Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Like, you know, when I was younger, I watched them in what was it? I think it's Far and Away. You know, where he's Tom Cruise has got this really horrible Irish accent and the two of them go to America. And so I was, that to me was Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, you know. I think they're in Days of Thunder as well, possibly. But that was their relationship. And then, you know, you, you read all the Hollywood uh, gossip mags and all that kind of stuff and you hear about things going on. And then Eyes Wide Shut came along. Some bad stuff happened and the two of them ended up breaking up sometime after you know these it was pretty soon after i think yeah these yeah. star-studded romances don't necessarily work that well sometimes especially when you have to work together i mean some people have theorized that their roles in this film may have 
led towards the breakup. Yeah, it does kind of feel like that. But like I said, in 25 years, I was like, nah, I'm good. And then it came up on the patron list. And I'm like, okay, now I need to sit down and watch it. And it's two hours and fucking 39 minutes now i know i sound like such an old man when i talk about how long a movie is but there's a couple of points one your movie has to be that long for a reason not just because you want it to be fucking long and two it has to be entertaining to the point that when you get halfway through fucking a almost three hour movie you go Ooh, I can't wait for the next hour and a half. If you get an hour and a half into the movie and go, how long's fucking left? It's really not hitting its mark. And so I, I was like, oh, I can't be that long. And then I looked at it and went, and I had a complete different experience because when the film credits popped up, I was like, oh, it's over. Oh, no. I thought I still had more film to go. You know, funny enough, I was like that because I fell asleep the first time and I had to go back and rewatch the ending like twice just to kind of make sure I hadn't missed oh, no. anything. And guess what? I didn't. <laughs> Stop. Oh. <laughs> oh. We hope you enjoyed the music tonight. We're going to be here for the next two weeks, so please do stop by. I'm Nick Nightingale. Good night. But like I said, we're we're starting with 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 Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman at home. You know, Doctor Bill and Alice. And the first thing we get to see in this movie is Nicole Kidman's ass. Oh yeah, <laughs> she drops that dress. It's like oh. Oh, it's oh, how you start a movie. <laughs> apologies if you get sick and tired of seeing my face in this review, but it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be everywhere. <laughs> I don't mind my face being on Nicole Kidman's ass. <laughs> I bet you don't. I bet you don't. But uh, I mean, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise, they literally signed open ended contracts with Kubrick wow. prior to production because uh, Kubrick, well, notorious for having very long shoots, yeah. shot everything in Pinewood Studios in London. Uh, but their open ended contracts basically meant that they were only allowed to work with Kubrick until Kubrick released them from the contract. Wow. So they couldn't go off and make other films. Whoa. They couldn't go, we've gone past this, you know, agreed upon time. Yeah, I need yeah, to yeah, leave yeah. and go back to America. It's yeah. like, no, you're here until it's done. And uh, that was their dedication to the to the, the script. dedication. They had yeah. a sit down meeting with Kubrick, so they knew everything going into this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Nicole Kidman also had quite a few nude scenes in the film. Yeah, she has. And uh, she uh, basically said to Kubrick, because of this content, I would like final refusal mm. in all of the the nude scenes. So when the edits made, if I say no to those things, you'll take them out. Kubrick agreed. And then Nicole Gilman actually didn't refuse anything. She nice. let it all go. Yeah. And even when she was filming some provocative, raunchy nude scenes, apparently it was either, it was just Kubrick and her on set. No yep. one else. Brilliant. Just him behind the camera to make her feel at ease. Yeah. And so when he was asking her during, well, a sex sequence that is in flashback throughout the movie, yeah. um, which apparently they shot for like three to six days uh, just for those flashback sequences. It's less than a minute of the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just to show how long you know the shoot went for. Uh, she would constantly turn and go, I'll only do this for you, Stanley. Not a single other director would I do this for. Yeah, no. uh, but that, that was their dedication to him. And I just think it really comes through in, in this film as well. And, well, opening with her dropping her dress, it, it alludes to what the film is roughly going to be about. It's about yeah. sexuality and, and all of those things. And, yeah, and then we do get to see them as a couple. And it's a little bit, they're a little bit cold, I would say. They're, they don't come across necessarily straight yeah. away as loving. But a functional, well, I guess happy relationship, but just not a romantic one. It yeah. feels that way because everything just seems very precise as they get to this party. And then they split up and Nicole Kidman's Alice Harford character is at the party and uh, she ends up flirting essentially with this stranger uh, who approaches yeah. her. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. William Harford, Tom Cruise's character, is also being led away by two very attractive models. Yeah. And that was the funny thing, like you said, with their relationship, knowing in 1999 that, that Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman were together at this point of filming, when I see them on set, I'm like, this feels incredibly natural how a loving couple would be like. But at the same time, like you said, they're kind of cold. They're kind of... It, it seems like they've been together for, what, nine years, something like that. They're, they've got a little daughter as well, and the daughter looks about seven eight kind of 
you know, um, they're leaving the, the leaving the daughter with the nanny. I mean, that sequence when Nicole Kidman just seems to be peeing. I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> That's a lot more than I thought I'd ever see with Nicole uh, Kidman. It just goes to show how comfortable they are yeah, with each other. You yeah, know? exactly. There's no taboos between them, it would seem. But then also how comfortable they must be with the director because that's what Kubrick's asking for and it feels quite natural. So then when they go to this party and she says to Tom Cruise, like, do you know anybody here? And he's like, no. And you, you're introduced to Victor Ziegler, uh, played by Sidney Pollock, who stood there with his wife, and he says hello to Tom and, and, and Alice, and they have their little mingle. And then, yeah, like I said, they, they kind of split off. And Tom's talking to these two young girls. And it really felt like... It really felt like these people were kind of set up to lure them off. You've got this, you've got this older gentleman called Sandor who stood by the bar, and he sees Alice. And... You don't see how many drinks Alice has. She seems to pick up one uh, and has a drink. But when she stood at the bar, she seems a little bit intoxicated. And I'm thinking, if she's only had one, has somebody slipped her something? Or has she got a drinking problem that we are not, you know, we, we don't know about just yet in this movie? And then Sandor starts talking to her. And she, Nicole Kidman is an incredibly beautiful woman. You know, she's... She's Aquaman's mum, for fuck's sake. The film sucks, but she's Aquaman's mum. And the two of them are dancing, and he is smooth-talking her. He's he's requesting that they meet up. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, she... this Meet up? He, he wants to take her right upstairs and have sex right now. Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah that's it. That's it. And, and I'm like, oh, is this what sets off the whole situation between her and Tom Cruise? And then, like I said, Tom Cruise has got these two girls trying to flirt with him, trying to take him off. They want to take him to the uh, where the rainbow ends. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's immediately just pulled off by one of the guys who works for Ziegler and taken up to this room. Because it turns out that Sidney Pollock, fucking Victor Ziegler, is in a bathroom putting on some clothes because there's a naked girl on a chair. Who's had an overdose. Who's had an overdose heroin. That sequence was a bit shit, I've got to admit. Oh? Right. Now, I'm not saying I know what people are like when they go for a heroin overdose or anything. I'm, I'm, I've got no expertise in this. But it just seems like he calls, he, he gets his buddy to go and get Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise is a doctor who can take care of this girl. And so Tom Cruise comes out to take care of this girl. Now this girl is lying there on this chair. She's absolutely naked. You can see everything, pretty much. And, like... It, it's kind of implied that she's had this speedball um, and she's been doing drugs with the doctor. And I, I don't know if the doctor had sex with her while she was unconscious or like he, he you know, they had sex and then she, she shot up. And so, but Tom Cruise is checking to see if she's alive. And I was looking at the actress and I could see the actress breathing. <laughs> and the actress was trying her best to hide it, but she couldn't. So much so that he just kind of gently wakes her up. Well, yeah, she wasn't dead. Dude, she she was ODing. Yeah, but she wasn't dead. No, I so know she, she wasn't <laughs> dead, but she was ODing, which would mean doing something more than just kind of gently waking up the actress <laughs> and the actress waking up and him going, are you okay? And her going, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> Bitch, you just OD'd. You know, we should have at least been getting you to the hospital and sticking something in you to... to like I said, I don't know this stuff, but it just looked like the film didn't know either. Because, like I said, I am immediately suspicious of Sidney Pollock's character. Oh, yeah, rightfully so. Right, right off the start. I'm like, where the hell is your wife? This isn't your wife. Why were you... Why did you think doing heroin in the bathroom with a naked girl was a good thing? This, And Tom Cruise's... Dr. Bill Harford's character, he's not phased by it. He's not questioning it. He's not even, it doesn't even feel like he's uncomfortable with the situation. Well, I mean, he just accepts it and goes back. I guess his professionalism kicked in, you know, he just became doctor mode immediately and just didn't uh, question any of it because I guess he kind of idolizes yeah. uh, Ziegler. Yeah, he wants he does. to be him, he wants to climb that societal rung on the ladder. So he doesn't want to step on any toes here. But, but that's what I mean. But I, I would get it more if, if, yes, I understand he doesn't want to step on anybody's toes. But why don't you want to step on anybody's toes? If this is where you're going to want to be, 
oh, I want to climb the, the, the doctor's ladder with my beautiful wife so I can be in the bathroom at some point with a naked half chick who's ODing on heroin. You really need to kind of question where your life's going, man. Well, 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 that's why we've got a three-hour movie in front of us, Ian. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. But <laughs> yeah. not this incident will be the instigator for it, but it will play into the story later. Yeah, Alice and, and Sandor, they have this little thing, but but she pulls herself away from, from him. And then you're at home. So I just want to go, so at least right from the beginning, we've had, you know... Uh, um, Bill was almost pulled away by by two girls to have mm-hmm. you know uh, a, a fun threesome, time. A threesome, yeah, a threesome, yeah. <laughs> uh, but he was interrupted and called away because yeah. he looked like he was going. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Alice is actually the one to give the refusal and say no. Yeah, there was no interruption. Nobody interrupted them and no. pulled her away. She just went. I'm married. I'm faithful. So no. Yeah. Even in her drunken state. Yeah, you're right. She 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 turned away and she told Sandor she didn't want any of it, and so it. It then, when they're at home, um, you know, one of the things is, this film is set at Christmas, so it's borderline a Christmas movie, okay? Borderline, depending on how you work those things out. But they're at home, and she happens to find some weed, and I was just like, okay, I could get into this. And then she questions Tom, Dr. Bill. She questions him what happened to these two girls. And so he says to her, the truth he's honest he's like no i didn't go off with them i got called away ziegler was in the bathroom there was a situation i had to take care of it and then it honestly felt to me like alice instigated an argument do you realize that what you're saying is that the only reason you wouldn't fuck those two models is out of consideration for me like Yes, I, I, I can understand that Dr. Bill, Tom Cruise's character, may have said something um, out of place because he's a man. Men do open <laughs> our mouths and say stupid things that we should never say. Um, but she really went off on one. It was like death by a thousand cuts. It was, yeah. I love this sequence. Yeah, it was great. It's the way that she kind of almost baits him in a way to yeah, screw yeah, up. And yeah. he does. And he kind of, I mean, the thing that catches her is when he blankets all women by having the same kind of sexual appetite or behavior or sensibility. Yeah, that was fucking stupid. And, exactly. And that is what gets her, uh, her annoyed and frustrated with him. And that's why she goes, all right, motherfucker. Yeah. I will prove to you and I'll recount this story about. Hey, you remember this naval officer at this place that we went to? Yeah. And then she goes into detail about how she was paralyzed by just a glance that this man gave yeah, her. Yeah. And that led into a full, fully detailed fantasy that she lived out with this stranger yeah. over that night and the following morning until she knew that the naval officer was gone. And she said she was relieved because. You know, the, uh, the, she may the, have gone. She with may him. have gone, but it was just her fantasy, not her reality. And my God, the, the entire sequence, like the, the the music was there to begin with, and then it sort of got serious as it just hit yeah, that note. It did, yeah. And then the camera on on, on Bill's face as the intensity and the rage oh, and the man. anger the, is building up in his eyes as he yes. finally gets to look up and look her in the eyes. Yeah. That it's was just an angry Tom Cruise. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was massively done. Like the tension, the captivation, the actors doing their part and uh, i also love the break in tension as well where he's just like no I, I i wouldn't cheat because i'm faithful and i'm married to you and i would expect you to do the same because you're my wife and she just kills over laughing she has a laughing fit yeah i, I love even even the camera starts wobbling and falls on the floor with her during this laughing fit and i was just like i mean that's for me that was like that was our audience way of 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 relating to her because the camera is behaving her way yeah because Bill is watching her, but he's not moving. He, no, is, he is rigid. rigid he he is paralyzed with anger, so the camera shouldn't be moving at he, all. He's because in... it's been so still this entire time. Yeah, and it was a moment of levity of a break there, where we're trying to understand really where she's coming from because she can't get her words out anymore. No, she she implies to Bill like, yes, I love you and I'll be faithful, but there was a moment. And that crashes his whole entire existence. World down. Yeah. yeah, he is fully believed that as he's the doctor and successful, he's got this beautiful wife, and that she will always be faithful to him and never will do anything. And now she's just told him this that he's just like, 
it was like a gut punch. Like, what the fuck have I been doing with my life that I've been so strict, structurally rigid with you and I've not done anything with any other woman in any other situation that now you're telling me that you almost did that? And I was like, oh, I wonder if they had this conversation outside of this film. Well, that, that, I mean, this is what this whole film is about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's more interesting, well, I mean, because the film has lots of scenes in it, but it's more interesting to talk about what the film is about and what it means and what yeah. each scene is trying to say. I mean, I don't want to go too deep, but after his relationship with Nicole Kidman, he'd go and have a well, relationship with Katie Holmes, and then she would call him out years later about yeah. his whole Scientology bullshit stuff. He's in the cult. You know, yeah. <laughs> And so it's just like, okay, what was Tom Cruise like when he was young? You know, at this point, when he's, when he's, at this point, he's still a, a building, building up a star, stardom for himself. You know, he's not the amazing producer, actor, director, you know, multi-million dollar star that he is now. He was, he was, he was just coming off the back of Mission Impossible 1, you know, which he, he which he was just like, oh yeah, I'm never going to come back and do any more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like from that point, he's thinking, "Oh, I, I'm just going to keep acting. I'm not going to build a multi-million-dollar franchise on Mission well, I Impossible." I just love his range of films as well. Oh. He doesn't stick to one type of genre. So, no, no, but he ha he has, he has elevate himself and I think this has come up after Eyes Wide Shut because he's like no I want to act I want to try to be funny I mean fucking Tropic Thunder right you know he, he's <laughs> willing on doing that role in Tropic Thunder but he gets called away Dr. Bill such a fucking weird situation Dr. Bill gets called away by Marion Nathanson who tells him that her father Mr. Nathanson has passed away and Mr. Nathanson is like a, a, a really expensive client for, you know, Dr. Bill. So he has to go over there. And so he goes over there and he's checking over the body and he's making sure that Marion is fine. Marion played by Marie Richardson. And she just immediately just tells him that she's madly in love with him and that she wants him and she, and she just wants sex there and... You know, even though her boyfriend, Carl, was like literally coming around the fucking corner to come over and help her. She's willing on throwing it all away for Dr. Boo. And Tom Cruise is like, uh, I don't know you. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, we've never shared more than any other conversations other than about your father. So how am I supposed to love you? Well, he's, I mean, he's also just come from that conversation he's had with his wife. Yeah, yeah. We had the first flash back i yeah. guess to uh his interpretation or his visualization of the fantasy oh, the which fantasy. didn't happen yeah yeah yep. uh, and that's that's uh what's fueling him at the moment and so then to just see uh you know marion literally thrusting herself on him mm. it, it, it's again it goes against what he believed was the way of things yeah, yeah. and so it's it's a first challenge for him and again I, I guess of course the the very first temptation because yeah he is feeling angry and betrayed uh, by his now adulterous, unfaithful wife, because that's the way he sees it. And so he's tempted by Marion, but he does, you know, uh, change his mind. But then at the same time, he is also interrupted because Carl, as you mentioned, <laughs> does turn up. Yeah. And I thought this was an amazing sequence as well, because Carl and Mar Marion are like the doppelgangers for Bill and Alice. Yes. I mean, if you look at Carl and 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 Bill, they, they look they the same. They pretty much look the same. You know? Yeah. yeah. And and now it's the fact that he is now aware of the fact that Marion is ready to cheat on him. Yeah. Or to blow up their entire marriage. And so, again, it's just another sort of level into his journey now that he's going on about himself and his entire existential existence about marriage and love and lust and... and that's it and at the same time all he can think about as well is his wife cheating with this naval officer, with this naval officer that never happened but so he's it, just, in his he's, mind it did and, and that's it it's all in his mind weirdly enough from the moment he left uh, the, the, the Nathansons after he'd spoken to Marion, it felt like this movie just went on an after hours trip right. <laughs> like like like, he, he left this house and then it was just weird shit that just happened and he just he just went back to work the next day. Because we've also got Nick Nightingale, played by Todd Field. And Nick Nightingale is a piano player and they initially see him at Ziegler's party and it turns out that Nick Nightingale and, and Dr. Bill Harford went and studied medicine together. 
Um, but Nightingale dropped out and Bill went off to become the successful doctor. Did you recognise Nick Nightingale? No. Man, I recognise that goatee out of anywhere. I know, isn't he an actual musician? <laughs> no, he was in Twister. Oh? Yeah, he's one of the he's one of the kind of storm chasers that works with Bill Paxton's uh, character. I, I like I said, he he's got the same goatee in Twister, like three <laughs> years before. And I was sat there looking at him, I'm like, man, I know your motherfucking face. And I looked at that goatee and then I had to look on Twister and I looked on his IMDb. I'm like, oh my god, it's, it's, it's that guy. It's, it's that guy. But well, anyway, before we, he does manage to catch up with Nightingale, yeah. it's after he's left Marion's, he's kind of walking through the streets of New York, and yeah, there's yeah. lots of those shots, yeah. all shot in London. Now, again, just to go to uh, Kubrick's level of detail, he sent all of the production team that were building the set off to New York to go and measure the sidewalks, wow. to measure the roads, wow. to look at where the newspaper stands were, so that they could replicate it and build it to scale exactly it, right. You know what? Th those set pieces are fucking amazing. Yeah. Now, it didn't work for all of the New York shots because, well, they didn't want to get... You know, Kubrick didn't want to fly. He didn't yeah. want to go over there. Yeah. So what they did was they green screened Tom Cruise and they had rear projection, sorry, playing in the background while Tom oh. Cruise walks on a treadmill. Wow. And you can see ever so slightly that he's superimposed in. Yeah. And for me, that gives the whole thing a sort of dreamlike... Uh, aura about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even when he's like in the car driving, you can see that it's clearly, uh, you know, um, just a background rear to... projection. Yeah. Uh, but it also, from in my mind, like interpreting it, it it's that um, it's his state of mind that everything else around him is a blur that he's not really there anymore yeah. because he's wrapped up he's so wrapped in what's up. going yeah. on so much so that he almost gets pushed over and beaten up by a bunch of Yale college kids yeah yeah and uh, and at the same time yale fraternity college kids they're like cult and of themselves oh uh, yeah yes. yeah Just, uh, and hey, college kid <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up meeting uh, a prostitute who solicits him to come into her place yeah and that's when you know he's he's he feels uncomfortable but at the same time he's there to cheat he wants revenge on his wife he thinks Cheating in, in real life is probably not even as bad as what she done in her fantasies. Did you recognise the prostitute? I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vanessa Shaw from yeah. fucking Hocus Pocus. Yeah. She uh, she signed a contract to work for two weeks on this shoot for her one scene, and she was there for two months. <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, Filming this sequence. At the same time, this sequence was really, really well done, because, you know, she's a prostitute. She's inviting him back. You kind of know where this is going to go. But then... He has never done anything like this before. He honestly, you know, feel Tom Cruise's character, Dr. Bill, is like a fish out of water. Like he's never slept with a prostitute or slept with anybody else other than his wife. And now he finds himself in this apartment with this girl. And he's looking around. She's she's like, oh, I apologize. It's the maid's day off. And he, you know, it's like, you know, to him, this is a, this is a poor person's house. What do I do? Where do I go? And stuff like that. But then even when... Even when it, it seems like it's going to go to the next step that, you know, they're going to have sex. And this, I think this was initially where I realized that this was my problem with the movie is where it builds and builds and builds to something. And then he's interrupted. Hi, is everything all right? Yeah, I was, um, I was just wondering if you were going to be much longer. You know, he, 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 he's getting ready yep. to have sex with Domino. And you and you think it's better because you're feeling for the guy. He's just been told by his wife that she was thinking about cheating him. You feel like he's down. You feel like this is the reprieve. And, like, you know, everybody talks about this film filled with sex. So this has got to be the start of it. And his phone rings and it's Alice wondering when he's coming home. And he's like, oh, well, I'm still in the middle of something, so I'll call you back. Because obviously he doesn't want to talk to her because he's really upset with her, but he's not going to start screaming and shouting over the phone, his personal stuff in this stranger's house. So he ends up just turning to, you know, Domino, Vanessa Shaw's character, and he's just like, how much? And she's like, 150. And he's like, here you go. And they don't even have sex. He just pays her. She's even willing on not taking the money. Yeah. yeah. And he's just like, no, honestly, kind of in a way, thank you for listening and talking to me. And then he, he leaves again. And I, at that point, I was like, fuck's sake, movie. Honestly, <laughs> I expect the titties and ass all over the place. I ain't seen shit. <laughs> yeah, but he's on this odyssey. You know? and it's like Dante's Inferno. And he's got to go through all of these levels of hell Man, before he 
Did I already go on an odyssey in space with Kubrick? I could have gone on another fucking odyssey. Yeah, but this one's of the sexual variety. And this is where things get super exciting as he does meet with uh, Nightingale, Nightingale and Nightingale again. alludes to this feast for the eyes that he, he wears blindfolds at this this lustrious mansion where there's girls that you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And so, of course, Dr. Bill's super excited. I mean, he's rowdy as hell right yeah, now. He's, he's like, super oh, horny. You come know? on, Nick. Yeah, so he's like, I well, go. I've got the password. Now just tell me where it is and I'll go get the costume because I just need to get my rocks off right now. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. interestingly, there's a Stanley Kubrick cameo in this oh, in the sequence. Uh, sat off to the left, just as uh, Bill and Nightingale are sitting down. Um, Kubrick sat over on the left, wow. looking at the band, and he looks over at Tom Cruise like twice. <laughs> he's probably checking. He's hitting his marks. So yeah, his marks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's where he gets the information. Then he races off to where the rainbow ends. It was kind of alluded to. Yeah, earlier, I, I to go that. and get a costume and. This sequence in the film is the only one that I'm I'm a, I'm just unsure of because yeah. for me this entire scene ends like a pantomime sketch. It is so over the top, yeah, uh, that it just doesn't feel natural. It really doesn't. It, yeah, it's it's weird. And we've got the store owner, Mister Milch, who is played by the same actor, and I'm I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name because I I've just screwed it up. But it's played by the same actor who played Boris the Blade in Snatch and also played the head of the assassins in Tekken 2. And so immediately as soon as I saw the guy, I was like, <laughs> how, how good or bad can you make this sequence? And I don't want to diss the actor, because I'm sure he, like, he was great in Snatch, and I'm sure he's done other great roles. But as Gary said, this whole, this whole sequence could have just been cut out from the film, I feel. You know, because he, him and Tom are talking on the steps and, and Dr. Bill's just like, oh, I used to I used to be the doctor of the owner who owned the, the, the fancy dress shop. And Mr. Milch is like, oh, well, he left. He moved out of town and left me the shop. So now I'm the owner. Um, it's fucking like half past 12 at night. What are you doing here? Well, I need a mask and I need a cloak. Oh, well, OK. Yeah, no, come in. And so they go in and they're looking around. And I'm like, he's a store owner? He's literally just told us that he took the store off of the guy after he left. He's never owned a fancy dress store in his life. How is he ever going to fucking sell him any of this stuff? And then he, they hear a noise and they look in this room office or something, which is off to the side. And there's pizza and drinks. And he shouts and tells everybody to get out. And so these two Asian businessmen appear from behind a sofa, half naked. And then fucking Elijah Wood's girlfriend from <laughs> Deep, Deep Impact, Impact fucking yeah. jumps up. And she's in her underwear. And I'm like, what's going on here? I kill you. I kill you. I promise I kill you. And you. Have you no sense of decency, gentlemen? Have you no sense of decency? Well, I think we know. Well, yeah, I think. <laughs> but the point, but that's it. It's like you said, it's another, it's like, it's like Kubrick is trying to say that, you know, men don't believe that women can have sexual fantasies. Well, that's, that's a lie. Of, of course they do. If you don't believe that, then more to fucking fool you. But it, it's Bill, especially our protagonist and antagonist to himself in this film that needs to learn that. Well, yeah. but And I'm, deal with it. But I'm like, <laughs> did you need this sequence to kind of knock that home? Because I have no idea how old the actress is. You know, the young girl playing Dr. Milch's, uh, Mr. Milch's daughter. You know, but she's soliciting herself to these two men or they've or or they've convinced her to do this because they're willing on paying i don't know there's no background to this situation it just that's why it feels like pantomime yeah. a sketch show moment yeah. you know it's just very weird and it's the way that she runs and hides behind dr bill and yeah. holds him and yeah. whispers in his ear and kind of gives him that wry smile like, yeah like oh you're come next. back later yeah it's like, that's weird it's it's strange, but again, it, it's another level of temptation. You know, it's, uh... I think I'd have preferred it if he'd have gone home and gotten a costume and cloak from home. Instead, we get, like you said, a farcical kind of pantomime sequence that really doesn't go anywhere. Because even when he comes back later, he has a brief conversation with them. It doesn't go anywhere. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of 
awkward and awful we, when we find out that you know the the two men come out from behind the shop again yeah and uh, they're just like yep had a great time thank you yeah because and, and the dad's holding the girl and he's just like yep fine come again you know we'll uh yeah, i'll solicit my daughter for cash it's like what th- in that's the what world I'm, yeah that's what i'm saying when he comes back yeah. spoilers when tom cruise comes back to the fucking costume shop fucking Mr. Milch fucking from Tekken 2 says, oh yeah, by the way, I'm prostituting my daughter now. 30 minutes ago, I was really angry at her doing it. Now I realize how much money I can make. Yeah, that's why it almost feels like the scene that was a facade for the doctor, like a play to just go, look, I'm not really doing this with my daughter, even though he may have been in on it from the get-go. I don't know. It's just, it, that's why it's just so, for me, it just, I need yeah. to, maybe I need a deeper reading into these scenes. I need to rewatch those scenes to understand them a bit better. But yeah, I, it no. does feel... <laughs> Off. One and but, done for me. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. Uh, but then he now has his cloak and, his, yep. and he gets into a taxi. And yeah, he walks was... up to the two guys. He gives them the password. Yeah, but it was fucking stupid. Fucking stupid to turn to the taxi driver and go, yeah, just wait. For as long as you need to wait, I will pay the bill. You just wait here. And the taxi driver's like, okay. And I'm looking at the film. Like I said, didn't wiki it. Never watched it before. And I'm like, I bet you that taxi driver knocks on the fucking door. Because that's what taxi drivers do. They don't just fucking sit there for four or five hours. They need to guarantee their money's coming in. So he goes, you know, just wait here. And then he goes up and he, he gives the code to the guys. And they let him in and he wanders in with his mask. And you've got the weirdest fucking ritual. And... I know this shit happens, okay? I'm not as stupid as I may think. But at the same time, like, there's... This was, like, on a fantasy level as well, wasn't it? You know, between the masks and the guy in the red with the incense burning and the... All these disrobing, naked, voluptuous ladies. (laughs) That's it. It was... I feel like... Like, I feel like they could have been a bit more diverse... Because, you know, all the girls were kind of of a certain size, uh, a certain look. You know, you, you kind of know what they're going to be up to when they go around the, 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 the orgy or building or whatever. You know? Because he, he sees all this and then they all go wandering off. And one of the girls comes wandering up to him. They all, get, all the girls get kind of allowed to go off to different places and they choose men I'm assuming to go off and have sex I don't know how orgies work I've never been a fucking one <laughs> shocking <laughs> um, and one of them comes up to Tom and without even knowing him or seeing him she just immediately says you shouldn't be here you're in danger so you're like oh oh it's a secret society if they catch him he could be killed his wife could be killed no no <laughs> this threat is empty it's absolutely fucking empty you, you can't be here. You're in danger. And then she gets taken off by somebody because they realise that they sh- she shouldn't be talking to Tom Cruise. And then he wanders around and you see, uh, admittingly, you do see actors and actresses in certain situations. Sexually. In certain positions. Yeah. In certain positions. <laughs> but and it, lots of onlookers. But it, Yeah, <laughs> lots, lots of onlookers. But it's but it's all acting fake. It's all very tame or uh, yeah, like overly done. Like, but I don't know. I, for me, it's the whole atmosphere of it all. I love yeah. the, the set design, yes. the music, the yes. lighting, the yeah. positioning, the blocking, the editing. Yeah, uh, you you're kind of fascinated as you go around these corridors and into these rooms as you see different various acts being performed. But yeah, but there's and, and I, you're wondering how long he's going to stay there before he either leaves or joins in. I, d- I don't I don't like admitting this, but. If you have seen enough video footage of people doing these types of things, you realize that when you when you see it in those films, people are a lot closer. You know, they are they are, you know, practically skin on skin. In this film, it was like, right, we just need to imply. And exaggerate. And as exaggerate. Well. You know, you've got two girls, like you know, in the 69 position, they're not touching each other. They're just in that position while the camera flows past. Because, and I felt, Kubrick's hands were a bit tied. It's 1999. Well, he couldn't be as risque as he wanted to be in the 70s and 80s. Well, from from what I heard, he, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but mm. the, he watched like... Um, Porn? <laughs> no. <laughs> he watched films like Fatal Attraction, Basic Instinct. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, 
uh, and showgirls, actually, oh. to just see what was permissible, what was allowed by the the MPAA, you know, the Motion Sensor Board, uh, to, and they he the. The, the studio also will just like make sure we don't get an X rating, you know, or an R rating. We want like oh, the NC yeah, seventeen yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So he it's, would have gone it's not far. not X rating. And so he wanted to make sure, okay, that was allowed in those films, so mm. I'm not gonna go above what they shown, but that's like the yeah. expected level. Yeah, and on an, on another level, the focus is like we said, it's on Doctor Bill. It's not on this orgy. So really you don't see a lot for very long. And you, like Gary said, you're thinking, oh, is he going to join in? Is this the moment where he disrobes and Tom Cruise throws himself at this orgy? No! Spoilers! Nothing happens. He, he gets caught and he gets taken down in, to the, the Grand... The Inquisition. Yeah, yeah, nobody expects the Inquisition to be at an orgy. It's the fucking Grand Red Wizard Inquisitor. Fucking... And he sat there and he goes, well, you knew the password to get on the grounds, but what's the password for actually being involved? And Tom Cruise doesn't know because there wasn't a password. They're tricking him. And they're like, well, now you will be punished. And the girl who warned him earlier, warned him earlier told him to get yeah. out. She sacrifices herself for him. Why? We've never met this girl before. We have no idea what her connection is to Tom Cruise's character or why she's doing all this, but she's willing on giving up her position, her life, or whatever it is, for him to be freed. Now, we don't know this right away, but we'll find out that that was the same girl that was having an overdose at the beginning of the film at the first party, who's oh. now here, and obviously she knows who he is. But he doesn't know her. I mean, he keeps asking her to take the mask off at points when yeah, they are discussing. Yeah. And I, I believe it's because, in a way, he's also looking for his wife. Because he might think that she is she's cheating and cheating would go here. to these types yeah. of things. Whether, you know, whether he believes that to be true or not, he kind of just wants to know. Yeah. He wants to catch her, maybe. Uh, but at the same time, he also wants to make sure he's safe with whoever it is. But it also turns out to be the girl. And because he'll find out on the next day that the girl that has sacrificed herself for him, that he did resuscitate kind of at the beginning has also now turned up dead the following day yeah because once he leaves the orgy because the taxi driver spoilers taxi driver does knock on the door no 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 the taxi driver the the guard tells him that the taxi driver is at the door but then is led right into the inquisition that's so right it was a trap right. it was a trap it so was whether trap. the taxi driver did or didn't we don't yeah. know um but once he leaves the orgy and, and he ends up going home you know he's He's still kind of shocked. He's still having fantasy, you know, flashbacks of Nicole Kidman to things yeah. that never happened. But he interrupts her while she's dreaming. And she yes. confesses that the dream was where she was having sex, sex with, with lots and lots of men. Yeah, the Navy guy, loads of men. And in the film, she says, you were there, but you were watching. In the book this was based on, the, w the wife says to the husband, Wasn't you were crucified? there and you were crucified. That's right, yeah. <laughs> while I was having sex and I'm laughing and that's when you caught me laughing. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> so she's got some dark fantasies and some, uh, yeah. 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 But that's what I mean. At that point, that's why I kind of, you know, I would have much preferred their whole conversation, the film to focus on their relationship and how they're dealing with it. The whole fancy dress shop thing just seemed like a, a waste or like you said it was just to add on a couple more layers to to tom cruise's character that it's he, another he temptation. These temptations yeah. and i'm like <sighs> because obviously when he does now after hearing about his wife's dreams so she's fantasizing about these other men she's dreaming about these other men yeah this eggs him on for round two you know and so that's when he goes back to the store and he sees the girl and the temptations there but he's like nope that's not for me what is it none of this Goes up anywhere. He goes. To he the goes back to find the prostitute from she's, the day before, and gone. we found out that she's gone. And she also was just found out that she had HIV. Yeah. And so he almost slept with her, but didn't. So yeah. I guess by making the right choice, and he was, he was kind of spared. He was two seconds away from shagging her flatmate. Yeah, this is true until she broke the you know the tension or the the the, the horniness by yeah. dropping that bomb. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. By the way, my friend like, had HIV, and he's like, Yeah, I'll, I'll be going. I'll now. be going now. <laughs> And, uh, and then he goes and he calls up Marion. 
Yeah. And uh, but Carl answers the phone. Carl, he's like, "Well, I can't pursue that one anymore." So he's like, "Now, what am I going to go? Yeah. Who am I going to have sex with now?" Well, that's it. He goes to the hotel and he meets up with uh, fucking Alan Cumming, isn't it? From fucking that's right. Because he's trying to pursue what happened to a Nightingale. Nick Nightingale and and, and Alan Cumming, who's who's playing the hotel clerk. So a small bit of trivia for you. Apparently, yeah. Alan Cummings had to audition six times just for the bell clerk role. <laughs> well, I gotta admit, I mean, this role was, you know, pretty deep. And at the same time, Alan Cumming almost made it seem like a joke. Because I like Alan Cumming. I, I think he's a, a great actor. You know, I loved him in GoldenEye. I, you know, if you've ever seen The High Life, that's how old I am. That's how I know Alan Cumming. When I saw him in this, I'm like, man, this Kubrick movie seems way out of your league. Like, you're a good actor, but you're going up against Tom Cruise, Sidney Pollack, Nicole Kidman, you know, fucking Stanley Kubrick. So to have to work, you know, audition six times for that role, yeah, he had to make sure it was just right. Because he then, he gives this information to, to Dr. Bill to say, oh yeah, by the way, Nick Nightingale was taken early this morning by two large men. And they whisked him off. And so I'm like, oh my God. Colt got him. This, Yeah, this is where the real thriller stuff comes in. This reminds me of The Firm from 1993 with Tom Cruise, you know, because now all these seedy people have gotten involved and his friends have gone missing and they might be dead and he's going to be investigating it. And he went back to the sex mansion and he got given a warning letter. Yeah, stay away. That was it. And... He, oh, and don't forget, he's also followed around the streets as well. There's somebody stalking him. That's it, yeah. There's somebody stalking him. So he goes back to Sidney Pollock. And he has a conversation with him about what's been going on. And, I, like, I don't know many roles that Sidney Pollock's have done. But this, it just seems so neutral, the way he just kind of gave him all the information. Oh, yeah, by the way, Bill, I was there at the orgy. Oh, yeah, by the way, Nick Nightingale, nah, he's still alive. He, he wasn't kind of risked or taken away. Oh, oh the, the prostitute that, that, that uh, overdosed? I mean, it was natural. She just yeah. went home and she, overdosed. She like, did, yeah. So, because you read her in the paper, yeah, she, she died. That, that's just happened. But the way he kind of clamps his hands on his shoulders at the end and goes, you're a doctor, right? So you know all about life going on until it doesn't. Yeah. And I'm just like, was that a was that a cryptic kind of... Like, maybe we did right. do them, kill them off. That's it. But I'm you like... don't know, because you don't know. Yes! <laughs> I know, it's great, because you... No, it's not! <laughs> no, it's not, because I'm sat there, and I'm like... But life goes on. It always does. Until it doesn't. <laughs> but you know that, don't you? I like I like a film to at least imply that there is danger and you've seen the danger and you know the danger's there but you you don't necessarily have to have to have the danger thrust in your face right I get that. there's a lot of thrusting there's a lot of thrusting <laughs> but with this movie it's like I know there might be danger um I've seen hints that there might be danger um I've think I've seen sequences that might be dangerous but it's all right <laughs> <laughs> because he does go home yeah and uh, but the thing is I mean this is the bombshell moment is that his mask that he wore to the orgy is on his pillow right yeah he put that there well, I'm sure Alice did as she found Are it. Are you sure? Well, it's, yeah, because it was on the pillow next to her. Who else put it there? The guy in the fucking street that was following them around, maybe? No. Bullshit, no. motherfucker. No, no. No, I'm, no, I'm wrong. Alice just called and went, oh, look, it's his mask. He must have worn this at an orgy. I know, I'll put it on the bed next to me. Oh, it's it says many... a lot. <laughs> it says a lot doing that. Because now she, he has to confront it immediately. See, exactly. And it does. He breaks down because now he has to, well, explain what the hell he's been doing for the last couple of nights. That's what I mean then. Then, then the idea of it being a thriller is just completely out, uh, out the window. Yeah, it's not. It, does, it was because, sold that way. Yeah, I would have, it's not. I'd have preferred it if, it if it was implied that somebody had put the, the, the mask there to say to him, hey, we're still watching. I mean, you, I mean, you invaded I'm, not, our I'm world. not negating that as a possibility. No, but that's the thing. The film, the film doesn't tell us that. It doesn't tell us that Alice found it. I would have preferred if Alice had said, I found your mask. It's too obvious. But it's... I get it! <laughs> I get that it's too obvious! 
But it's also highly fucking frustratingly annoying when the director doesn't even put any of those things there. The, the mask could have bad... For all I know, the mask has a fucking life of its own. Climbed out the fucking drawer and climbed on the fucking bed to look at Tom Cruise and go, I know what you've been up to. Because, because Alice puts the mask there and he still just has to tell her. And even though, what the fuck are you going to tell her? Oh, by the way, dear, you know that night that you told me that you were going to have sex with that Navy officer and you didn't? Well, guess what? I went to a prostitute and didn't have sex with her. I met a woman called Marion who wanted to have sex with me. And guess what? I didn't have sex with her. I went to a fucking full-blown orgy. There was shit going all over the place. I thought you were there. I thought I was going to catch you being done in the bum in some room. And guess what? I did fuck all. <laughs> Yeah! Put a star on that man's chest. Yeah! Because <laughs> he's, he's not going to do fucking anything else. Is oh, also, there was this fucking young girl with these two Asian men who fucking... Her father was going to sell her to me. And guess what? I didn't do her either. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, what an ending. What an ending. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, we don't get to see any of the uh, retelling or of the event, so we don't know what details he kept in or kept out. But we do see Alice looking at the camera, and <laughs> she looks like she just got smacked with a shovel. So she has been emotionally hurt by everything that's just happened. But then she, in a way, instigated it. But at the same time, he, in a way, was in such a way that he needed to kind of have an awakening. And so now they they were both antagonists and protagonists in destroying each other. But the main thing is, none of them actually cheated, <laughs> except with their minds. And so what the film is about is about jealousy of your mind or, or of your partner's minds, because you can't control their thoughts. And often or not, you don't know what they're really thinking, you know? So... I thought the ending was fantastic because it was also optimistic because their their marriage didn't end. You know, they are still making a go of things. And their final conversation in the toy store kind of shows that she might be a little bit more aware of her feelings and where she is in this marriage than yeah, he yeah, is. Yeah. She's like, don't use the forever word. You know, we'll just go with how things are for now because forever yeah. is kind of forever. But I, I thought it was a very good ending where they look like they will be able to make a go of things now that they're more open with each other and accepting of their their minds. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I, I agree with that. If 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 his eyes have been opened because they were shut, yes. no pun intended, well, yeah, um, yeah. you know, if his eyes have been opened that there's this whole world out there that he's never known of and that fantasies and partners can have these things, then yeah, ultimately they can build on their relationship that they hadn't built on the first nine years. They were kind of living a dream, I suppose. The important thing is, we're awake now. And hopefully, for a long time to come. Ian, what were your favorite scenes? Um, well, I mean, like, I'm not going to beat around the bush, no pun intended. Nicole Kidman. But, <laughs> like, like, she's a very attractive lady. And I've got to give it to an actress who really is um, willing on, on putting herself into that position. You know, like, it can't be easy to take your clothes off in front of a director, even if it's just a director on his own, you know, and film a sequence and hope the sequence comes across... Um, realistic and natural while you're in the nude but the sequences with Nicole Kidman including the sexual sequences with her um, in the fantasies and stuff like that you know she really I've always felt like Nicole Kidman's an actress who before 2000s she was just the arm candy in a lot of her films I, I remember in, I think it was 2001 I saw her in the others and I was like this woman is phenomenal i hadn't watched eyes wide shut at that point but now now i have with the others i'm like you know what she is still phenomenal aquaman may be shit but she's all right in it i mean i thought the argument between the two of them was a really great sequence um personally because obviously i'd seen a lot of the news around them at that time when the two of them had broken up about the issues if that had been real or not because of the papers i don't really know um I, I do know I've never seen them work together ever again, um, which 
I think is a bit of a shame because I think the two of them are absolutely phenomenal. But at the same time, that that sequence where she is she's instigated this argument and and she's screaming down to him. And what makes it even better is when you flip it to the other side and you see Tom Cruise's face. You know, like there was a lot of emotion just in that face. He was close to tears. He was close to breaking. Uh, man, I'd never like to be in that same situation with that same look on my face because damn, he looked hurt. The orgy sequence, um, very well filmed. Kubrick knew what the fuck to do with a camera. He knew where he wanted people to be stood, where he wanted things to be placed. He knew to have enough um, enough flesh up front for you to go, oh my God, that's absolutely you know disgusting or whatever and not realize what might be going on around the corner. The colors and visuals he put in those sequences, you know, like I said, with the incense, the guys burning and the red costumes and all the different masks, it, it was like a fantasy. It was like it shouldn't really be there. But deep down inside, I knew that, Jesus Christ, these parties are happening pretty much all the freaking time somewhere quiet behind closed doors. The, 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 the staring council, when he comes walking in and just, there's just masks looking at him. They all look like they're laughing at him as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's absolutely quiet because they're all kind of silently judging him as well. Like, who? what's he doing here? He's invaded our world. It's like, all right, calm down. Not doing anything that the rest of us haven't done before. And I suppose, you know, what better way to end a Stanley Kubrick movie than with Nicole Kidman saying the word fuck? Fuck. Th yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she says it with such a way that I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, in a way, it's kind of weird for, like, it's kind of a happy ending for a Kubrick movie. Like, know, most of them it? don't end happy. Well, Full Metal Jacket kind of did. They're all singing. Oh, it's true. Yeah. Jack Nicholson <laughs> smiling. Uh, yeah, I suppose, but I don't think he's very happy. He might be smiling, but I don't think he's very happy. <laughs> he's very dead, actually. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like I, I really struggle to find favorite scenes in this film because the whole film is so well crafted. Mm. Um, but if I had to pick one scene, uh, it's for the performances and for the dialogue, the way it's written, the way it's filmed, and it is the scene where they they smoke uh, some weed and they kind of just just talking about the party yeah. before things get serious, and then the revelation of the fantasy and the dream yeah. and his reaction that leads the entire rest of the film. So. All of that sequence was really well done. And it's, it's some of the dialogue where she uh, says, uh, where he's just like, well, you know what men are like. And she's like, well, if I know what men are like, then you would clearly would have wanted to have gone slept with those two models at yes. the party. And yeah, so the yeah. way she turns things back Turn, around, around on him, around him, it's just the way it's written. It's it's really, really well done. Uh, and then if I had to pick one more, it may be the, the brief interaction between uh, uh, Dr. Bill uh, when he meets Carl and they shake hands and Marion's there on the side and yeah. the way that it fades out after he leaves as well. It's just like, oh, it was like the doppelganger's you know, moment, the mirror image. Yeah, in that sequence where he meets Carl, it's almost like Tom Cruise is trying to bite back a laughter like your missus doesn't fancy you, but I'm just trying to be nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but, but that's also where he was as Carl beforehand. So he's yeah. kind of all... all, all also sympathetic for Carl's yeah. situation because yeah. he was there uh, in his mind not too long ago. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, there's there's so many great sequences. The whole film is spectacularly filmed. The cinematography and editing is, you know, precision. But I should also bring up that there's been a lot of talk about how you know Kubrick it's his unfinished masterpiece because yeah. when Kubrick presented his final draft to the studio had a small screening and then he passed away had a heart attack a few days later yeah there's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there you can go and pursue those however you wish uh but um it wasn't the final cut per se because the studio still had to put the music in there yeah, yeah they yeah, still yeah. in some you know in some region i think in america had to censor some of the nudity to get to that rating yeah which kubrick kind of had his blessings for uh but it was I believe from interviews I've read that the film was handled with Kubrick's intentions and wishes respected so that the studio didn't just go, well, I'll take that scene out and that scene out and we'll yeah. rip that out. I don't think that was the case. So I still think it's as close to Kubrick's vision as he wanted or could do until he passed away. Well, I heard that there was 
there was some extra editing done for the North American release. That's right. Um, and so there is an uncut version. Well, the of... normal version released in Europe, and then America eventually got our version. Yeah, which, I mean, there's not really much missing, really, for no. an unrated cut. Other there's than nothing, there's nothing crucial talking. to the story or anything. Um, yeah. But I did really think it was interesting because... There was there was some people on some side saying, oh yeah, you know, he 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 was so happy with the film. It was one of a he was he was ecstatic. he thought it was his best work. He thought it was his best work. He was ready to go, and that's why he passed away because he relaxed. <laughs> that's what they some people say. <laughs> yeah, that because he relaxed and sat back after that's, three that, four years of tension. Yeah. yeah, that's when he died because he was known to just keep editing, keep editing well, even before. I think he was it, in the Guinness World Records for like over four hundred days of consecutive shooting of the film. Film. Right, yeah. Like, so, so people don't know where he his mind was. But I did, I, I did think it was interesting because uh, Arlie Ernie, Ernie, yeah, reportedly said that like Kubrick called him up like a week or two weeks before he passed away to say that he had he, he had thought the enjoyed. film was a piece of shit and film... that the critics are going to eat him alive when yeah. the film comes out. Now, I've I've heard that story, and but I've not heard it corroborated, and I, I've also heard. People of the Kubrick estate say that Ermi doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. It's like, and, okay. And I, I, part of me kind of feels the same. Like, no, I don't think that would be the case. But then at the same time, I also know what it's like to be editing something for so long that you think you're doing really, really well. And then one night you think, I'm a, ha I'm a hack. I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, you know. And so that could have been that one night where he's just like... A moment of doubt. Yeah, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who to talk to. Everybody's blowing smoke up my ass. I need to speak to one person who might be honest with me. And so he calls up Arlie Hermy <laughs> and says, I think this film is a piece of shit. And Arlie maybe gave him a little bit of advice and said, no, nah, crack on with it. You're, you're great. You know, you and me worked well for Full Metal Jacket. And so he went back... He finished it off and he got it out. But then again, even when the film came out, critics hated it. Audiences didn't want to go see it. And yet, to Kubrick, it was this greatest work that he'd done. Yeah. Well, Ian, do you recommend Eyes Wide Shut? I personally don't recommend this movie. And the reason why I don't personally recommend this movie is because I personally found it didn't go anywhere. It really ended and weirdly enough like i'd been i've been mulling over this for about five or six days since i watched this film over in my head did i like it did i not like it did i hate it is it bad comparing it to shitty movies comparing it to good movies comparing it to kubrick movies comparing it to other movies i like i went through all manners of emotions with this fucking film and uh, i just i i had to just say at the end like i can't personally recommend this movie to you because personally i I didn't enjoy it, and I don't think I will ever go back and revisit it. I, I can't think. I can't think at the moment of a day where I go, oh, man. You know what? I'm gonna watch Eyes Wide Shut because reasons. Um, and so I can't recommend on that because I don't want to say, yeah, yeah, I do. I think it's absolutely amazing. And people go off and watch it and come back and go, Ian, what the fuck are you talking about? It's, these are the reasons why you should hate this film. So personally, no, I don't recommend it. But I do recommend this movie if you have any thought of the inner workings of cinema if you have any real personal feelings to the history of the silver screen and directors and actors and actresses and what they go through and how they build something stanley kubrick is a master no doubt about it. If you have never seen a Stanley Kubrick movie ever in your life, don't even come and talk to me. Go away. Go away and watch some of his films and then maybe come back and discuss me because he is a master of his craft. He has made so many influential movies over our time that I feel that Eyes Wide Shut is one of those films. It's up there with A Clockwork Orange. It's up there with Full Metal Jacket. It's up there with Barry Lyndon. You may not know why, and I may not be able to fucking explain it to you, but it is. Don't try to argue about it. On a, on a technical level, the actors, the actresses, the screenwriting, the music, the editing, everything of it just works. I can give you a hundred shitty fucking movies that Eyes Wide Shut just shuts down. 
okay? And the chances are a lot of you have probably seen 70 of those shitty movies before you've even considered watching a Stanley Kubrick movie. So like I said, personally, don't watch it if you don't want to watch it. But if you ever feel like you want to understand how cinema works, go watch Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, man, <clears throat> I'm wholeheartedly <laughs> recommending Eyes Wide Shut. This is an underrated masterpiece that gets better with each subsequent viewing. It's layered with themes of jealousy, revenge, lust, betrayal, temptation, and self-discovery. It's a film that can be interpreted in many fascinating ways, while depicting high society and depraved cults in a dreamlike state. You know, the film is often mesmerizing, as Kubrick leads you into this world as you follow Dr. Harford on this odyssey to hell and back. On a technical level, the film is gorgeous visually, with fantastic lighting, set design, costumes, locations, sets, the cinematography and the edits, all to perfection. The music by Jocelyn Pook superbly underpins the film. It's haunting, but it's also inviting, and then also ominous, and it complements the visuals sublimely well. The cast were great, Cruz and Kidman really showcasing their talent as actors, pushing and being pushed by a genius director to get the real truth of their performances. So yeah, high recommendation, must watch. And like many, my, my opinion of this film has changed over time, and I've come now to really appreciate it, so I would invite you to give this film a rewatch. I think it's more than worth it. Cruz... Kidman, Kubrick. Thanks for watching Off the Shelf Reviews. There is something very important that we need to do as soon as possible. What's that?